Alex Earl. We're here at Pure Plastic Surgery today, and it's Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. All right, so uh, I know I was off last week with the Hump Day, but uh, we're back. We're back at it again, and today I kind of wanted to bring it back a little bit old school. We're going to go back to basics, okay? Uh, back to basics, and the first subject uh, in the back to basic category here that we're going to talk about today is going to be abdominoplasty, okay? More commonly known as your tummy tuck, okay? So we're going to kind of uh, delve deep into the tummy tuck. We're going to talk about pretty much everything related to it. Um, and then, of course, I'll be happy to answer uh, any and all questions that you guys may have, okay? All right, so um, the first thing that I want to kind of talk about when we talk about the tummy tuck is, you know, what are all the different types, okay? Because sometimes or oftentimes, you know, patients get confused as to the different types of tummy tucks and, you know, which one is the best or, you know, the best one for them, okay? So there are quite a few types, um, so I'm going to talk briefly about each one, okay? Uh, the first one that a lot of patients ask about, but unfortunately not many patients are candidates for, is the mini tummy tuck, okay? So what is the mini tummy tuck? Mini tummy tuck, you're talking pretty much just a skin surgery. All you're doing is you're simply removing some excess skin below the belly button, okay? So you're not releasing the belly button, you're not doing muscle uh, repair or plication, uh, you're not doing any of that. Yes, there is going to be some lipo involved with this, you can certainly do some lipo to the abdomen, flax, and the waist. Uh, but you're not doing anything else, okay? This is typically for a very specific type of patient. This is the type of patient that ha only has a little bit or a moderate amount of skin laxity below the belly button, okay? Their skin above the belly button is doing well, uh, and so it's just a little bit of skin laxity below the belly button, and also these uh, types of patients, they don't have weakness of the abdominal wall, they don't have a diastasis, okay? So for that very type of specific patient, then yes, they would be a candidate for a tummy tuck, okay? So that's why I would say this is kind of a, a minority of patients. I wouldn't say it's the majority of patients, okay? Now, the majority of patients need what's called what's your typical full tummy tuck, okay? So your full tummy tuck uh, does involve then the removal of the excess skin. It involves the releasing of the belly button. It involves the muscle repair or plication. And then, of course, your liposuction to the planks and the waist, okay? So that's your full tummy tuck. Now, another misconception uh, that's out there is that a mini tummy tuck means that the incision is mini, like a C-section scar. And that's not true. The incision for a mini tummy tuck is still going to be longer than a C-section scar, okay? And then the, the incision for the full tummy tuck is going to go all the way out hip to hip, okay? It's going to be a hip to hip incision. All right? Most patients fall into this category because most patients have some sort of weakness of their abdominal wall or a diastasis, which needs to be repaired. And they have skin laxity, not just below the belly button, but above the belly button as well, okay? So when you have that, then you need to do your full tummy tuck so that we can do our dissection, which you actually take from down here, all the way up here, we dissect all the way up here, we release everything, release the belly button, stretch everything down as much as we can safely, and remove the excess skin after having done that muscle repair on the inside, okay? So that's your full tummy tuck. The next thing category is what we call the extended tummy tuck. When you have an extended tummy tuck, it, just, it means that you're, you're pretty much bringing your incision out even more laterally and sometimes, sometimes um, towards the back. So you're going around the corner, around the corner and towards the back. That's your extended tummy tuck. Which patients are these? These are typically those uh, like the massive weight loss patients. They have a lot, a lot of excess skin. In order to try to remove as much of that excess skin, while minimizing the risk of dog ears, you gotta extend that incision around the corner and towards the back. So that's your extended tummy tuck there. Everything else is the same. You're still doing, you're releasing your belly button, you're still doing your muscle repair, you're still doing your liposuction to the planks and the waist, okay? So extended tummy tuck really refers to how far, how far back you have to take that incision, okay? And then last is uh, what we call the floor de lis tummy tuck. So the floor de lis is not just a horizontal incision going from hip to hip, but it also involves a vertical incision in the middle of the abdomen, up and down in this direction, okay? So it's almost like a T, right? It, it goes, you have your horizontal incision and, then, and it goes up as well, okay? Now, back in the day, it used to be a little bit more popular for massive weight loss patients because they were doing their weight loss surgeries open, which means, meant they already had that scar. They already had a laparotomy scar. Uh, but, you know, as weight loss surgery has uh, gone more and more laparoscopic, 
endoscopic, and that's actually pretty rare to do these open, they don't have that vertical scar. And so for most patients, they don't want to do a Florida E because that's kind of what they wanted to avoid in the first place, right? If you want to go out you know, in a nice kind of two-piece swimsuit, you don't want to have that vertical scar. So again, not a lot of patients are going to want this. Not a lot of patients are going to qualify for this. It's typically for like the for like the really, really massive weight loss patient. Like they, they just have so much excess skin that you gotta take it, you gotta remove it not only like in, the, in that direction as you pull down, but you gotta remove it in this direction as well, uh, you know, creating the two, the two scars there. So that's your Florida Lee uh, type of tummy tuck, okay? Um, what does your typical tum you know, tummy tuck include? Like I said, it includes your muscle repair and your liposuction to the flanks and the waist, okay? That that's, comes with all, pretty much all tummy tucks, okay? Uh, unless, except for the mini, which doesn't do the muscle repair. What are some of the things that we can uh, commonly add to that? One is hernia repair. So a lot of patients have a little belly button hernia. You know, it, it's very common with either, either you had a lot, you know, you're very, very heavy or uh, through pregnancy. So we can certainly do our hernia repair uh, with your tummy tuck. It can be a, a belly button hernia or umbilical hernia, or it can be what we call a ventral hernia, like a hernia along the, the, the midline there. So we can, add, we can add that hernia repair to your tummy tuck. Um, if it's a small area of lipo and you're, and you're not too big of a patient, we can add that. But remember, here in Florida, we are limited to how much fat we can liposuction at the time of tummy tuck. And that amount is 1,000 cc's. We can't do more than 1,000 cc's according to the Florida Department of Health. So if you're a smaller patient and you want to add another small area, such as arms or chin, then that's uh, something you know that we can possibly do, okay? But if you're a bigger patient and you already have the 1,000 cc's in your flanks and your waist, then we shouldn't be adding any other areas, okay? And we're not gonna be doing like a lipo 360 with your tummy tuck, okay? Almost no patient will qualify for that. Almost, you know, patients are gonna have more than 1,000 cc's so we can't do that. So we won't be combining a BBL or a lipo 360 with a tummy tuck, okay? We're not, that's something we, we won't add, okay? All right, and then of course, you know, a lot of you know that if you add a breast, you can add a breast to a tummy tuck uh, and that becomes your body makeover, okay? Or you can add an arm lift if you want as well. So arm lift, actually I didn't write it down here, but arm lift is okay too. So your brachioplasty, you can add a brachioplasty to your tummy tuck. If you combine all three, tummy tuck, arm lift, and breast surgery, whatever that may be, breast lift, breast, lock, breast reduction, uh, that's what we call the trifecta. That's your uh, trifecta perfecta right there. So arm, leg, hmm. tummy, tuck, and breast. Okay. All right. Any pressing questions at this point? We have a few. How soon should we stop doing ab exercises before a tummy tuck surgery? You don't necessarily have to stop before the surgery. Actually, there's, that's okay. There's no need to stop before. Uh, but after surgery, you're going to uh, have to take it easy. So no heavy lifting, no strenuous activity for at least six weeks. Okay. Six week minimum. All right, some patients, maybe they heal and restore, they may need eight weeks, but it's not gonna be any less than six weeks. How can you tell if a tummy tuck is needed versus just liposuction? Can you explain how the skin and the abdominal yes. feels and looks? So that's all about the degree of skin laxity. Skin laxity refers to how loose the skin is and also to the quality of the skin, okay? So if you have young, supple skin, so it's typically a young patient, never been pregnant, never had fluctuations in weight, um, and not overweight at the time, then and not a smoker, <laughs> that's another one right there, then they typically have um, good skin uh, elasticity, there's not a lot of skin laxity, um, and so they are typically a good patient for liposuction alone. Uh, now, if you've had pregnancies, weight fluctuations, have been overweight, smoking, sun exposure, all those things uh, lead to increased skin laxity, meaning the skin is loose, okay, uh, or it has stretch marks. Stretch marks is, a, is, a, is a, like a telltale sign that that's a poor quality skin. Uh, and so when you have that, then it's, it's quite possible that you're going to need a skin tightening procedure, which uh, can be anywhere from something like body tight to a mini tummy tuck to your full tummy tuck, okay? So the way to evaluate that, of course, is by sending your photos and your videos, but, and then also when we do your actual physical examination. Uh, and so if I feel that you have a certain degree of skin laxity, then I will you know, mention that to you and we will talk about it. Um, and you know, just so you know that say if you're coming for your BBL, 
It is quite possible that your skin may not retract completely, that it may not retract evenly, okay? And that's due to poor skin quality, not because there was uneven light or anything like that, but you have skin laxity, and therefore the solution then, three to four months later, could become a skin tightening procedure, such as a tummy tuck, okay? Yes, sir. All right. All right, so let's get a little bit into uh, pre-op, what's needed before your tummy tuck. So uh, we're going to go through the, you know, some of the same labs and everything that we do you know, before general anesthesia. So your labs, are gonna, of course, include your chemo level, your electrolytes, your, your you know, coagulation panel, so you know, how, how well you clot. Uh, we're going to do your pregnancy test. We're going to do your, um, your HIV test as well. Okay, so all those labs are going to be needed. We're going to need your EKG. EKG is going to be for everyone, okay? All comers, um, and then of course, and your medical clearance. So medical clearance is for all comers as well. Now, uh, are we going to need some other tests? Well, that depends on you know some of your medical conditions and whatnot. So for example, if you have a thyroid disorder, then we have to get your thyroid labs, okay, and perhaps an endocrine clearance as well. Uh, and then chest X-ray is not for for everyone, but it's for if you're over 40 or if you have some sort of like underlying you know chest condition such as asthma. So if you have something like that, then we'll ask for your chest x-ray. If you're under 40, no, no chest or lung issues, then we won't ask for that. Okay? Uh, but these are all very, very important. Everyone, please remember, this is incredibly important. Please remember, we got to have all your pre-op stuff. We got to have everything done at least two weeks before surgery. Okay? We need it to be done at least two weeks before surgery because that way if something is off, we have enough time to address it. Okay? If it's one day before surgery and something's off, then we just have to cancel. And that, that's, you know, that's not good for anyone. It's not good for us. It's not good for you. So we need to have everything in at least two weeks before surgery. Please, please, please. Very important. Okay? All right. Uh, in the OR, you know, we, we've had a lot of videos. You guys have seen me do it. It's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, we, we execute the plan. Uh, typically, it doesn't take too, too long. It depends, on, uh, of course, on the extent of it. But the average is probably about an hour and a half or so. So not too, too bad, about an hour and a half under general anesthesia, okay? Quick question about yeah. muscle repair. Is yeah. muscle repair optional? Would that be recommended if I still wanted to get pregnant in the future? So, I mean, it's somewhat optional, but it depends really on how your, how your belly looks and how much diastasis you have, which is the separation of the muscles, or how much weakness of the abdominal wall you have, okay? So if you have a little bit of a, a kind of a, a protuberant belly because you say you've had three pregnancies, um, it doesn't matter how much you work out, you know, you just can't get that flat belly. It's typically due to either the muscles having separated, that's called a diastasis, and they never came back, or to just weakness of the abdominal wall. The muscles are just, they're just weak. Um, and so for those patients, we highly, highly recommend the muscle repair to be able to tighten up those muscles um, and achieve that flat abdominal look. Okay, now say you're someone who, who were, was able to bounce back. So you had a pregnancy, maybe just one, and the skin didn't bounce back, but the muscles did, and they, you, know, you have a good, good strength there, they're not very far apart, and you don't want to do it, then that's fine. We can just you know, not, we can skip that step, basically. Okay? Are there complications with tummy tuck for someone who has IBS? Uh, there's not any additional complications for someone who has irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, so, of course, we always get your clearance. We make sure that you're not on any medications that might interfere with anything. But other than that, there shouldn't be any additional complications, okay? Yes, sir. One more question about the muscle repair. How far, how far apart does the muscle have to be to warrant muscle repair? Probably anything over two centimeters, okay? So, uh, your typical muscles are probably no more than one centimeter apart. Uh, about two, up to two might be tolerable. But anything above two, which you really kind of bring together again, otherwise it's going to become very, very visible, especially after your tummy tuck. Too. So these things become more visible after your tummy tuck than they are before then. Remember, before then you have more skin, more fat, you know, things are kind of being camouflaged or hidden underneath. But after your tummy tuck, all that's going to be a bit more visible. And if you have that separation, then you're, not, you're just not going to be happy, okay, because you are expecting a flat stomach and things like that. And so in order to do that, we need to do that muscle repair. Okay? Thank you. All right, so um, so let's get into a little bit of post-op care, which is which is very very important. Of course, I always say you know uh, post-op care is you know like the surgery is pretty much only half the battle. Okay, uh, the post-op care is the other half. So if you, if you don't take care of yourself after surgery, what looks like an absolutely incredible, beautiful result on the table can get completely ruined. Okay, so this is very very important. When you commit to surgery, you're committing to your post-op care. 
okay? All right, tummy tucks are gonna come with drains, okay? I, did, I do drain, uh, I, do, I use drains, excuse me. I don't do drain this tummy tuck. That's a very common question we always get. Why don't you do drain this tummy tuck, Dr. Earl? I don't wanna drain this tummy tuck, I hate to drain. Okay, I get it, all right? But it's not just a matter of whether you put in a drain or not. When you do a drain this tummy tuck, you gotta change your technique. Okay. When you do a drainage tummy tuck, you gotta you gotta put some sutures to, to basically bring down that dead space you're creating when you dissect all the way up here from down here. Okay. So what ends up happening is that you have to put up a whole bunch of quilting sutures to kind of close down that dead space. Okay. Now when you do that, there's uh, you know risk of contour abnormalities, meaning like little indentations or things not laying nice and smoothly or higher. Uh, and, then, and then also uh, the risk of infection is a little bit higher because there's just so many more sutures in there. Uh, and then uh, the, the time is a lot more time as well. I don't like to keep my patients under anesthesia you know, very long. That's why we're so efficient here at Pure. Uh, we do our surgeries here faster probably than most people because I, I love to be highly efficient and not keep my patients under anesthesia for any, any longer than they have to be. Okay, so I don't do drain this because for all those reasons. So I use two drains. Uh, they can be in anywhere between one to three weeks, depending on the patient. Typically, the smaller patients uh, don't have the drain as long, okay? But really, the criteria is not about time, it's about volume, okay? Once that is less than 25 cc's in 24 hours, then that drain is ready to be removed. Usually, the, dra the left drain is ready before the right drain, okay? But it's about that volume, so it's not about time, it's about volume. Once we get to about three weeks though, by that time, uh, the risk-benefit ratio starts to change, so the chance of a potential for infection or something by having the drain becomes higher, and therefore at three weeks, I typically remove the drain uh, no matter how much the volume is coming out at that point in time, okay? All right, the other thing you, you may wanna consider after the surgery is a recliner, okay? Because you're gonna walk a little hunched over and you're, and you're gonna wanna sleep in either a recliner or if you're in the bed, that's okay, but you need like two or three pillows behind your back, one or two underneath the knees, because you wanna relieve the tension in that belly area, okay? Um, and so that's why the recliner becomes very important. Um, you're gonna start off in your abdominal binder, which is gonna give you some nice support, and you're gonna use that until the drains come out. Once the drains come out, then you can switch to your garment or your faja, okay? Um, and then the, this, is, this is the most important thing regarding your post-op, okay? DVT prevention, blood clot prevention, okay? The, the, one of the things we worry about the most with the tummy tuck is the potential for blood clots that can start in the calf and the leg, okay? And then go to the lungs and cause serious problems, okay? So, uh, but we do multiple things to try to prevent that or minimize that risk, but it's never zero. Guys, remember, nothing in medicine is ever 0% or 100%, okay? But what we do is we, we put you on, uh, we give you some compression stockings, which you're gonna wear for at least a week, okay? You, it's best to have more than one pair so you can switch those out as needed. And then the other thing we're gonna do here at Pure is that we are gonna give you, as part of your package, what's called a sequential compression device, okay? The one we, we give you is called Circulate. We, you put that around your legs, around the calf area, and it keeps circulation in the legs moving, helps to prevent DVTs. And you're gonna be using that for two weeks, all right? Two weeks, at night while you're sleeping, during the day when you're not being active, you're gonna use it for all travel, especially air travel, incredibly important, okay? And this is gonna protect you from blood clots. A lot of people ask me, Dr. Earl, do you use Lovenox or blood thinners? I don't, okay? Why? Because the, the, the risk of using blood thinners is bleeding. Of course, okay? So, multiple studies have shown that for relatively short surgeries, an hour and a half, and people under a specific BMI, say less than 30 or so, that using a sequential compression device such as the Circulate is uh, equally effective in preventing DVTs as something like Lovenox or another blood thinner, okay? So I like to use that because you get all the gains and none of the risk of bleeding, okay? And it's part of your package. All our patients that are getting a tummy tuck are gonna get this device, okay? Thank you. But that doesn't mean you're off the hook. <laughs> that means you guys still gotta walk. Walking's incredibly important, people, okay? So you wanna be up and walking about 10 minutes every hour while awake, okay? Even though you have that circulate on, okay? Great.
and then of course you know six weeks no heavy lifting no you know no, no strain sensitivity do not submerge the body under water only shower for the first six weeks okay all right any questions regarding that oh we didn't talk about massage massages yes that's right i'm sure we got some questions that are massages necessary like they are for life on bbl okay so I do recommend massages after your tummy tuck. They are gonna be a little bit different and the focus of the massage is a bit different and the number of massages is a bit different, okay? So initially, uh, early post-op, the massages are gonna be more for the, for the flank and waist area where you have the liposuction and then also for your lower back. And you're gonna be saying, why lower back? I mean, we didn't have any surgery there or lipo there. Why are we doing massages there? And that's because a lot of patients develop a little bit of spasming or lower back pain because of the position that they have to be in when they're walking around all hunched over with their tummy tuck. And it's gonna greatly relieve that pain and make the patient feel a lot, lot better. So the first few massages are gonna be focused in those areas. This is the flanks, the waist, and the lower back, but not in the front, not along the area where you have your incision. After about two weeks or so, we've given that incision some uh, time to heal, some initial time to heal. And then you can start getting you know, massages to the front area as well. How many massages in total? You probably want to do somewhere between 5 to 10. Okay, 5 to 10 is pretty good. Remember, for like OBBLs, from 10 to 20. Okay, so it's not as much, but you still, they can still be very, very helpful. Is it better to have a mommy makeover than a BBL or BBL than the mommy makeover? Yeah, it's going to be a very kind of patient-specific type of question because there's many, many factors there. It's not, it's not cookie cutter. Okay, so I have to evaluate you, I have to look at your, whether it's your photos, your videos, evaluate your skin, evaluate your, um, the amount of fat we have, evaluate what your goals are, and then determine which one, you know, we, can be, we should do first, okay? Um, all right. How so, do you know if you're wearing the right faha? How much, how much compression yeah, is enough? That's actually a great question because, again, just like I just said, like the massages are different between a tummy tuck and the, say a lipo or a BBL. Uh, the faha is also different in, in, in terms of what your goals are between a tummy tuck and a lipo and BBL. So um, remember, the first thing you're gonna be wearing is that binder, okay? And you're gonna be using that until the drains are out, so it can be anywhere between one to three weeks. Once both drains are out, then you can switch to a faha. And you want a faha that's gonna give you some nice support but you're, you're not, you don't want it overly compressed. Remember now, because this time we're talking about an incision that needs to heal as opposed to lipo BBL. So lipo BBL, once you switch to that stage two faha, it's gonna, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna give you quite a bit of compression. It's gonna feel pretty tight. You don't wanna be as tight with the tummy tuck, okay? You wanna, you wanna have some support, but you wanna also not ruin, you know, mess with the incision and you wanna have enough blood flows for that wound to heal. Okay, so it needs to be snug, but not overly tight or overly compressed. Okay. Can ab etching be done with the tummy tuck? Okay, good question. So uh, yeah, I didn't add it here as one of the adjuncts for, but for the right person or a right patient, um, we can do some, a little bit of etching there, meaning we can further define the rectus muscles, which are the ones that are here. Okay. We can't really do the obliques. Okay. So if you really want that kind of that very athletic look with the rectus muscle and the oblique muscles, that's reserved more for kind of a lower BMI, good quality skin, kind of lipo, high depth lipo type of patient. Uh, but with the tummy tuck, we can, we can define the rectus muscles, which are the ones here. Uh, and that's, that's certainly something we can do. We can define those, we can contour the abdomen there. Okay. Do you have an optimal BMI for the HD lipo? For HD lipo, yeah, um, it's gonna be probably less than 24 or so. Somewhere around there. Of course, HP is a little bit different, uh, but it's definitely going to be in that lower BMI range. So somewhere, you know, 20, 21, 22, uh, usually less than 24 um, for HD label. Okay. What are the risks of not wearing your faha? Can someone waist train instead of wearing the faha? For, for a tummy tuck? Tummy tuck, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can continue to wear your binder if you'd like to. I just, it's just fairly uncomfortable. If you want to use a waist trainer, you can, but not till everything's fully healed. So I'm going to say somewhere around, you know, six to eight weeks, okay, for a waist trainer after a tummy tuck, okay? So you'll use your binder, and then after that, you can switch to a, to a faha or a spank type garment. Like again, it's not, it doesn't have to overly compress. Once, you're, once that incision is fully healed, once that belly button is fully healed, 
Well, I switch over to the waist trainer, that's okay. If you're all, already scheduled, will the Circulate be added to your previous package, or do you have to purchase that separate? Um, I, everyone gets a Circulate, okay? It's a safety issue, so uh, it's, it's part of, it should be part of the package, but if not, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll work it out, basically, okay? Thank you. All right, so let's talk now what everyone hates to talk about, uh, which, but we should, of course, is complications, okay? Uh, so no matter how hard to try, no matter how you know you want to prevent everything as best as you can, um, complications can and do happen, and there's no surgeon out there in the entire world who has a zero complication rate unless they're just not doing surgery. Okay? <laughs> the only way to have a zero complication rate is to either not have surgery or not do surgery. Okay? Alright, so class again, number one, and I talked about that already, so that's why we work so hard. To try to minimize that risk. So you're wearing your compression stockings, you're wearing your circulate device, okay, and you're walking. Those are the three things that are gonna allow you to minimize that risk. Okay, but clots can happen. We're worried about the DVTs, which are the ones that happen in, in the lower extremity, in the calf region, uh, and the PEs, which are the pulmonary embolus, where they dislodge and can then travel to the lungs and cause major, major issues, okay? So we wanna try to minimize that risk, okay? The opposite of that, the opposite problem of that is, of course, bleeding or hematoma, okay? So, you know, we always try to be very meticulous, try to control everything, okay? But can a hematoma happen? It, of course, is a possibility. Uh, unfortunately, I've had one in the last three years, okay? Uh, so I had a pretty good run there and then, uh, and then had one. Uh, so it happens, uh, but the risk is very, very low, okay? All right, scarring. Everyone scars a bit different, okay? Why is that? There's a lot of genetic components involved and of course the aftercare for your scar as well. Uh, there are people that are prone to, prone to hypertrophic scars or keloid scars, okay? That makes, you know, the healing a bit more challenging. And then of course, you know, you want to make sure that you're using your, your silicone-based scar cream such as Silogen uh, twice, at least twice a day after two weeks. So you start two weeks uh, post-op uh, to try to get that scar to be as nice and flat um, as possible, okay? We always try to keep the scar nice and low and a nice gentle curve so that it's easy to hide in your swimsuit. But another area that's really pr prone to scarring, unfortunately, is the belly button. So, if, especially if you have a tendency for keloid scars, the belly button tends to want to keloid as well. So, what we, what we want to do is to kind of look for early signs of that, that belly button starting to get a little kind of, you know, keloid or hypertrophic, because uh, it's possible you may need some steroids, okay? A shot of cantalog try to prevent it from you know progressing or getting worse okay and then ultimately if a scar does keloid even after we've tried everything then sometimes a scar revision is needed um, to fix that scar or to remove the keloid or hypertrophic scar okay so and then we're kind of related to that are dog ears okay what are dog ears dog ears is sometimes where there's a little like a little pooch or a little excess left uh, on the lateral portions of course we always try to, to to prevent that as best as we can. You know, we try to bring the incision out as far as we can to try to minimize the risk of dog ears, but sometimes it can happen. Um, usually it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, a lot of times if you have a small dog ear, you typically treat it uh, with a little or scar revision basically under local anesthesia, uh, but it is a possibility, okay? Contour irregularities are, you know, a possibility with any, most of the stuff that we do, most of plastic surgery, so, uh, you know, we do, or we are doing some lipo to the flanks and the waist area. Um, no one's going to be perfectly symmetrical. Perfect symmetry does not exist. Uh, but sometimes there's some contrary irregularities that maybe uh, that can be fixed. Okay, um, and then these three are very important here. Okay, so we have wound breakdown, which basically means the incision opens up, and then we have skin necrosis, which means skin dying. Okay. And then the last one's infection, okay? So a lot of people ask, you know, why don't you do uh, a lot of liposuction in that central abdominal area at the time of tummy tuck, okay? So remember, this is the same area that we're, we're dissecting below it, we're lifting up the skin, we're separating it from the underlying uh, muscle and fascia, and we're basically going through a lot of its blood supply. So we're already going, doing that. And then if on top of that, you then add a lot of liposuction to it, Okay, potentially that's kind of a double insult and it can lead to problems with the blood supply to the skin, which would then lead to poor healing and wound breakdown or basically the skin just dying off, skin necrosis, okay? 
So you see that you know if someone is overly aggressive combining liposuction and tummy tuck, or if they if they if they made it too tight, like they're overly aggressive trying to get tight in that tummy tuck. Okay, so yes, you want things to be snug, you want things to look nice, you want to contour things. Okay, but there is such a thing as going too far. Okay, and that and that's why we want to prevent that. Safety is our number one concern at all times. So. If you're overly aggressive with your light bulb as combined with the tummy tuck, or if you're overly aggressive in, in you know, how tight you make things, that could potentially lead to problems with the wounds being open uh, or the skin dying. Now, there are certain patients that unfortunately are more prone to this just because of the nature of some of the, their comorbidities or you know, diseases that they have, such as diabetes. Okay? So diabetics have a higher risk of these last three, wound breakdown, skin necrosis, and infection. Okay, diabetics have a higher risk of that. The other thing that causes a higher risk for that is smoking. That's why if your nicotine is positive, your tummy tuck will be canceled. Okay, tummy tuck will be canceled if your nicotine is positive because nicotine constricts blood vessels, means less blood supply, means higher risk of everything. Wounds breaking down, skin necrosis, and infection. Okay. After a tummy tuck, how do you treat the scar on the belly button just to make sure that everything heals properly? And is it possible to do yeah. a revision? So the first thing, you know, initially what you're going to want to do is, is uh, make sure that it stays clean. Okay, people? Um, so to clean the, the deep portion of the belly button, the inside of the belly button, um, we tell our patients to use a Q-tip with hydrogen peroxide. Okay? And that will help clean it off, you know, especially in the first couple of days. Uh, after 48 hours, of course, you can take a shower, soap and water can hit all the areas that the, the belly button included, okay? And then you're gonna be using a little bit of antibiotic ointment, such as bacitracin or neosporin, around the incision twice a day, okay? All right, once everything's healed, then we gotta monitor the scar. You're gonna start using scar cream, such as Silogen, okay? To try to make sure that, that scar stays nice and flat and as thin as possible. And if for whatever reason it does keto it or does become hypertrophic, and we, and we have to revise it, then yes, you can do a, a belly button, basically scar revision down the line. What are some reasons that you would not feel comfortable performing the tummy tuck? Right, so, okay, so I'll, I'll name a few, but of course, if your diabetes is out of control, say your hemoglobin A1C is greater than 6.5, uh, I wouldn't do it. Uh, if you're smoking or if your nicotine is positive, I would definitely cancel that case. Um, if you have, you know, then, you know, if you have any comorbidities that are out of control, high blood pressure out of control, um, you know, things of that nature, everything has to be controlled and you have to be cleared before surgery. Um, if your coagulation panel is off, meaning that you're prone to bleeding, for example, um, then you wouldn't qualify. Your hemoglobin level needs to be somewhere close to 11, okay, at least 11 uh, for this procedure. Um, and then... You know, I talked about hernias and we can repair, you know, belly button hernias or some kind of smaller ventral hernias. But if you have like a big, big hernia, then that needs to be taken care of first. Okay, you have a large ventral hernia, then uh, you have to go to a general surgeon, they got to evaluate that hernia, they got to repair that large ventral hernia uh, before you proceed into doing something like a tummy tuck. Okay, so after the tummy tuck, how long should we take off from work? All right, so it depends a little bit on what type of work, okay, but for uh, office type settings, or uh, you can typically go back somewhere around three weeks. Uh, that's also around the time where you can start driving again. Now, if you have a, you know, a job that requires heavy lifting or strenuous activity, for example, you know, firefighter, uh, then you're gonna wanna take at least six weeks off. Thank you very much. How, let me get to the next question first. Let me Get these in order. There's so many, so many questions coming in. All right, awesome. All right, so is it okay to get pregnant after a tummy tuck? Will that harm your results? <laughs> is it okay? I mean, it's okay. Will it harm your results? Yes, it will. Uh, so yeah, we, that's why we always uh, recommend not doing your tummy tuck until you have a pretty good feeling, a pretty good idea that, that you're kind of done having children. Okay, so. If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's in the plan, like if it's in the works, like then, then don't do it. I mean, you're just, you're gonna come back, you're gonna have to do it again. It's just not, I don't think it's worth it. Um, so, yeah, you gotta be sure that you're done having, you know, no one knows anything 100%, but you gotta be fairly certain that you're not gonna have any more children, you're pretty much done 
uh, with that, and then you can do your tummy tuck. What happens if you lose weight after a tummy tuck? Right, same thing there. You want to be at your ideal weight uh, at the time of the tummy tuck, okay? Um, because if you lose a lot of weight, then things will become loose again. And then you may need that to be, you may need a second tummy tuck or you may need that to be revised. Um, and if you gain a bunch of weight, then things are not going to look good either. You're going to you know, gain a bunch of fat. You may gain a lot of what we call visceral fat. Remember, guys, the visceral fat is the one that's inside, inside the abdominal cavity where all the organs are. Um, actually, that's, that's a good point, which I didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. If someone has a lot of visceral fat, that tummy tuck syndrome is not going to make your belly look flat. Okay? So what visceral fat is, a, is the fat that's where the, you know, where your intestines are, where your liver is. It's the deep fat, the fat that we don't get to. The only way to reduce visceral fat is with diet and exercise. There's no surgical solution other than weight loss surgery, bariatric surgery, okay? Um, so actually, so they had asked me before, like who's not a great candidate for a tummy tuck? Uh, someone with a lot of visceral fat is actually not a good candidate for a tummy tuck because they're just not gonna look good. Yeah, we can remove the excess skin, but that belly is still gonna be kind of roundish. You're gonna have like a round belly kind of a protruding belly because you still have that visceral fat deep in there and there's nothing that we can do about that. Okay, there's not a, there's no amount of muscle repair that's gonna make your belly flat when you have a whole bunch of visceral fat in there, okay? Um, so yes, don't gain a lot of weight afterwards either because it can become visceral fat and you're gonna just have a rounded kind of barrel belly at once again. Can the stitches from the muscle re repair break or split? Yeah, that's why, that's, that's why six weeks, six weeks. No heavy lifting, no strenuous activity, okay? All right, if you do that, you can break the stitch or it can rip through the tissues and then your whole muscle repair is basically gone, okay? So you have to take it easy. Thank you. So after a tummy tuck, can you have lipo 360 or will that cause more loose skin? Yeah, no, you can actually, that's a great question. So that's why, again, we have to see where you're at, see what, what should be done first, what comes second. Uh, but you can certainly have a Lego 360 after your tummy tuck, and you know, believe me, I I've rarely seen people having to come back to have like a second tummy tuck because they had a Lego 360. Extremely rare. So for the most part, you can have your Lego 360, and everything still remains very you know fairly tight. That skin is able to bounce back. And and think about it, when you do your tummy tuck, which which skin is the one that you're removing, right? You're removing the poor quality skin, the one with all the stretch marks, that lower belly skin. You're removing the bad skin, and you're leaving behind the good skin, okay? So that's why, I don't, maybe that, that'll make more sense to you then. So that's why typically when you do your Lipo 360 after, that skin is a better quality skin, it's able to bounce back, and there's typically not an issue with renewed you know, skin laxity after your Lipo 360. The other very, very common question that we get is, oh, uh, Dr. Earl, am I gonna have enough fat to do a BVL afterwards? And the answer is yes, overwhelmingly yes. Pretty much almost all patients will have very similar amounts of fat um, after their tummy tuck than they would have before. And yes, you are gonna have enough fat to do your BVL. So don't be scared about that whatsoever, okay? So um, the amount of fat that we remove with that excess skin that we toss away, is, is not really doesn't contribute you know that much uh, to her overall fat. Remember when we're doing the tummy tuck, we're only doing lipo, a little bit of lipo to the flanks and the waist. We're not doing more than 1,000 cc's. Those are the rules here in Florida. So we haven't touched the central belly area. We haven't touched the entire back at all. Okay. We haven't touched any additional areas that you may want to do like thighs or arms. Okay. So don't worry about that. Okay. Don't be scared that if you do your tummy tuck first, you won't have enough fat you will have enough fat. In fact, you're gonna have pretty much a very similar amount of fat than you did, you know, beforehand. Thank you very much. I know you have to go soon. Okay. Pushing 40 minutes. Uh, I have a few questions. Okay. One pertaining to the BBL. When you liposuction during the BBL, do you lipo the mons pubis area? Yeah, we do. So if you want us to take care of that, that's not a problem. Um, so we can certainly lipo the mons uh, at a time of like a six year BBL. And I'm sure you've answered this question a lot, but is smoking marijuana okay prior to surgery and after surgery? So actually marijuana is okay. Uh, THC is okay. Um, again, what's not okay is nicotine. So you have to be very careful like what you're using to smoke it, okay? 
a lot of times you're actually ingesting nicotine and you don't even know it. And the problem is that when you come show up here, yes, your THC, your marijuana test is going to come back positive, which we don't mind, but then your nicotine test comes out positive. And that I do mind. Because um, if that's positive, whether you're actually smoking cigarettes or marijuana, it doesn't matter. It's in your system. We have to cancel the surgery. So a lot of patients are there like, no, no, Dr. Roll, I only smoke marijuana. I never smoke cigarettes. Well, I'm sorry. But if there's nicotine in your system, there's nicotine in your system. Okay? And then we have to postpone our cancel surgery. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, I hope this was very helpful. I think it was pretty comprehensive. Okay. Um, everything that, uh, pretty much everything that you need to know about tummy tucks. Um, okay, a few key pointers here. You know, if we decide that you need to do your tummy tuck first uh, for best results, then that, that is the best decision. That is our recommendation. And do not worry about having enough fat for your BBL later. Okay, you'll have enough fat. It's going to be fine. All right, everybody. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this. Um, and I will see you guys next week.